We welcome everyone out tonight. Uh, this is uh, going to be an interesting experience. Um, we're, uh, we've, we've come to realize recently that uh, we're sitting on uh, historic ground here. Uh, there's quite some history, um, religiously speaking, uh, concerning the ground that we're on here. And so we wanted to uh, find out what we have. And uh, so uh, I was going to do this originally myself, and uh, Jeff's so far ahead of me, he has all the stuff together. And I said, Jeff, why don't you come in? And he said, well, let me invite my friends in, the antiquarians. And I said, sure, great, uh, come on in. And so uh, we're glad to have you all here tonight. Uh, there's refreshments downstairs afterward. So be sure to go down and uh, put on some pounds. <laughs> uh, that's, that's good. Uh, there was a Lincoln uh, outside with headlights on, but I imagine it's probably, you know, those newer cars, you park it and it turns off automatically. I'm, I'm sure that's not a problem. Um, and uh, we will be turning off the lights here because the lights are in conjunction with the fans. And, uh, uh, you know, some, some of you have trouble with, uh, with your eyes, with the fans. So, um, Jeff's going to uh, take over here and he's going to spend as much time as he needs with the Chautauqua here. If there's any time left over, <laughs> I'm a graduate of Grace Seminary and so I spent some good time over there. And uh, that's been dubbed as the world's largest Bible conference, but it started out as not a Chautauqua, but as an amusement park. <laughs> I was surprised at that. And uh, it, it uh, mutated uh, and uh, grew to what it is now. So if there's any time left over, I have information on that. If there isn't, he's priority here tonight. And uh, uh, he is what we came to hear. So we'll turn it over to you, Jeff. <coughs> Well, thank you all for coming. It's nice to see everyone. And um, uh, I guess first question: Can everybody hear me okay, or should I turn on the mic? What do you What do you think? Uh, well, I guess you can't hear me when I'm not talking. Would you prefer the mic? <laughs> can you hear me now, or, or would you prefer the mic? You're good. Okay, you're good. Okay. Um, well, it's fun to be here. Actually, it's always fun to, to come come here to the Bible Church. I actually spent. Uh, several years as a, as, a, as a child going to church here, and uh, Pastor Dan's sons were two of my best friends growing up, so, um, you know, it's, it's just fun, good memories. Um, anyway, as, as he mentioned, and, and I should throw in, um, well, I'll let him talk about that. We thought it'd be kind of neat to talk about Billy Sunday and the, 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 what was going on over at Winona, because there's so many parallels or differences and similarities, and it's kind of interesting to see how that evolved when Culver's Chautauqua's really didn't. You know, Culver's only went so far, but that continues to thrive 100 years later. So I thought it'd be kind of fun after my, my, my side of it if, uh, if he could say a few, you know, spend a few minutes on that. Um, as, as, uh, as Pastor Dan mentioned, we are on ground that was part of the Chautauqua. Uh, we'll get into exactly where that was, but let's step back a little bit first and talk about what a Chautauqua is. Uh, you know, what, what is this word Chautauqua? Um, this is just an old postcard from Chautauqua Lake, New York. I guess I should get my notes before I say too much. Um, former U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt was quoted as saying that Chautauqua is the most American thing in America. Uh, the first one was the New York, technically called the New York Chautauqua Assembly. It was organized in 1874 by a Methodist minister named John Hale Vincent as well as a businessman uh, at a campsite on the shores of Chautauqua Lake in New York State. Uh, it was popular. The Chautauqua assemblies uh, were, you know, kind of grew out of that um, beyond New York State. And they sprang up in various locations around America, modeled after that. My understanding is they originally intended this to be kind of a Sunday school training ground, but it evolved into much, a much bigger thing, which we're going to talk about. I guess I don't need to hit the button. I'm not used to being able to move around. This is great. <laughs> Yeah. We're worse. Oh, I'm good. I'm, I'm good. I'm, I can see you. Okay. No, I'm okay. Sorry. Uh, it's okay. No, that's fine. Thank you. Um, independent Chautauquas uh, operated at uh, permanent facilities, usually an attractive semi-rural location. Here's some sample photos. A short distance from an established town with good railroad. Now, keep in mind, we're looking at the late 19th, early 20th century. 
Uh, this is a time before DVDs. This is a time before even movies uh, or really any electricity in most of America, especially rural America. So having something like the Chautauqua to come to was it was it was a lot more even than just coming to hear good sermons. There's a lot to it, uh, and this was big stuff for people. You know. Um, there wasn't a lot else in terms of entertainment and enrichment and culture in rural America. Um, at the height of the Chautauqua movement in the 1920s, several hundred of these independent Chautauquas, and again, these are sort of semi-permanent Chautauquas. These are not traveling. They're kind of like Culver's Chautauqua that was actually situated in one place. Uh, there, were, there were several hundred of these around the country, but of course they've dwindled since then. There are very few left. Um, there are at least three independent Chautauquas which have continued to operate. Uh, from the 1920s on into now, into the 21st century, um, which is a little bit, but again, these are a little different. I had my notes from the Billy Sunday site at Winona Lake, which we'll talk about, or Pastor Dan will. Oop, I went too far. Um, as opposed to the independent Chautauqua, something called the Circuit Chautauqua, uh, or Tent Chautauqua, that's kind of what they're better known as. As you can imagine, they were sort of itinerant, they were traveling Chautauquas. Um, basically, they would pitch tents, on a well-drained field near town, quote unquote, and after several days, the Chautauqua would fold the tents up and move on. Uh, these really didn't get moving until about 1904. That's when you see those begin to, to move around, around America. Uh, each performer or group appeared on a particular day in the program, and by the mid-1920s, when, when the tent Chautauquas were at their peak, they appeared in over 10,000 communities to audiences of more than 45 million in America, which is pretty staggering when you think about that. Um, and, but by about 1940, they'd run their course. And of course, I think part of that is the Depression would have hit, they hit everybody hard, that hit everybody hard. Uh, the war years really hit everybody hard. I mean, there were limits even on how much you could drive. So really, you see those kind of dwindling to a, to a, a halt by the 1940s. Shifting gears a little bit, let's make it a little more local. Uh, this is Henry Harrison Culver. Uh, he's born in the 1840s in Ohio. Uh, some of you already know all this, but some of you don't. He, he started a stove company called Culver Brothers Stoves around uh, 1864 in St. Louis. Uh, he breaks off from his brothers in the, uh, in the uh, Culver Brothers Stove Company into the Wrought Iron Range Company. And he ends up having a traveling sales force of about 200 people, 200 salesmen. And that was all structured on sort of a military system. Even though they weren't military, he would give them titles like you know, corporal and sergeant, that sort of thing. Uh, by 1886, he owned more than 300 acres in the Culver area. Uh, and by then, he's retiring. He's, he's in, even though he's only in his late 50s, he's not doing well health-wise. So he retires to the nice, tranquil, cool waters of Lake Maxincucky and buys these 300 acres on the northeast shore of the lake. Uh, in 1886, the Culver family built a large home near their cabin and renamed it the Culver Homestead. It's still there. Um, and uh, he bought 98 acres on the northeast corner of the lake bought another 208 acres at the north, north end of the lake, so he's obviously adding lakers, adding acres, not lakers. Uh, and he employs a number of men to drain, you know, to ditch and drain this land. Um, and so he puts in 22 miles of drain pipe, and he's ready to go. And again, Mr. Culver here is a businessman. Um, he, he didn't start out with a school, which as you can guess is where I'm going with this. But uh, he started out with this. Oh, sorry, I jumped ahead. That's his business in St. Louis. I forgot that was in there, sorry. That's the factory, the wrought iron range factory. And incidentally, if you're interested in any of this and seeing the first stove they manufactured, et cetera, et cetera, you can see all that at the Culver Academy Museum downtown, which is also where I work part-time. Um, anyway, he starts this. He starts this. It actually opened for its first season in 1889. Um, this is on, on the left. If I can get it to pop up here. On the left here is the hotel. This is his Chautauqua. Uh, this is his Chautauqua hotel there on the left and on the right. It's hard to see in there, but that's what he called the tabernacle. And I think that was a pretty common, consistent thing that they did with these Chautauquas, is you'd have this outdoor meeting area and call it the tabernacle. They didn't all call it that, but there seems to be a pattern here. Uh, so that's what you're seeing there. Incidentally, this, uh, this, this circled area at the bottom is, is part of the canal system. The whole Academy, Culver Academy grounds uh, up until about 1915, had a canal system uh, that kept it drained and all that. And so he, he starts a Chautauqua. Let's see here. Can help if I aim it the right way. Uh, again, this is an interesting shot because let's backtrack here really quickly. There's this shot, and you see the building at the left. Um, that building actually became the first Academy Barracks. 
Um, and, and it was replaced by this brick building, and that's basically the same body of water in front of it. So that brick building in the center there with the, it's hard to show you what it is, but with the, with the sort of turrets right in the middle is, sits today, still sits, where that Chautauqua Hotel was. But that's getting a little bit ahead of us. Oh, oh, back, 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 back. Mr. Culver <laughs> names his, come on. Ah, always works when you walk towards it. Uh, he names his Chautauqua the Culver Park Assembly. And he opens it in July of 1889. Uh, this is a really neat artifact. This is the first program from that assembly. Um, let's see. Uh, it actually attracted uh, more than 20,000 visitors. So imagine those people coming in. Now, by this point, uh, as, as of 1884, the railroad has come here. So these folks are coming here almost exclusively by train. You know, the roads were not good. That was really the way to get here. So these 20,000 people come here in the summer to Culver, probably in the course of yeah, there you see, in the course of two weeks. So that's, that's, that's amazing, isn't it? That's a lot of people. Um, it was, yeah, okay, it was, it was on the Abenabi Bay, as we know. Uh, he, he kept this open for two seasons, and, and I find this amazing. Uh, for 20,000 people, he didn't make any money, apparently, or he didn't make enough money. And let's keep in mind, he's a businessman. So, you know, he, he, he's going to shut it down. He shuts it down after the 1890 summer season. Oop, oop, oop. Um, and I just drew this in. This is the second page of the bulletin. And it's kind of fun because that house is still there. That is the Culver House, the Culver Homestead House. What you see there at the bottom of that pathway, that pathway is still there as well. And those are whale jawbones at the bottom. It was sort of a tradition. You'd get off the boat, the steamboat, and go through the whale jawbones and make your way up the path. And just as a little aside, those whale jawbones were moved to the Woodcraft camp. And they were there until the 50s when they just sort of fell apart. But his, uh, one of the Culver brothers brought them from, from Nantucket. In the, in the 1880s. So that's kind of a neat picture. Um, so uh, Mr. Culver brings in a, a couple of big names. Um, this is, uh, as you see, Reverend T. DeWitt Talmadge of New York. Uh, he also brings in Sam, Reverend Sam Jones of Georgia, Dr. John Matthews of St. Louis, and he says, we had great crowds to hear them. I had revival meetings and lectures for the whole of that summer, but since that time there have been no public meetings. There have been no public meetings of any consequence, and he's writing in the 18, 1890. Whoa, back, back. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, Talmadge, this is uh, Reverend Talmadge. He was one of the most prominent religious leaders in the United States during the mid-19th century. He preached to crowds in England. Uh, his sermons were published in more than 3,000 journals, uh, said to reach more than 25 million readers. So this was a big name. You know, I, I don't know if we'd say he was the Billy Graham of his day, but he was up there. Uh, Sam Jones, I don't have a picture of him, but the Reverend Sam Jones was another one who came here, and he was definitely more along the lines of the Billy Graham of his day. Huge name. Uh, he was one of the most celebrated revivalists of that period. Um, he's connected with the history of the Union Gospel Tabernacle, later named the Ryman Auditorium. And any of you who know much about the history of country music, the Ryman Auditorium, uh, the story is that Riverboat Captain Thomas Ryman, Thomas Green Ryman, was converted after hearing Reverend Jones speak in 1885. Ryman decided to build a tabernacle to hold revival meetings in Nashville, and that building later became the Grand Ole Opry. So, kind of a fun little, little, all these little, little, it's a remote call for connection, but hey, you know. <laughs> it's kind of fun. And he was, but anyway, they were here, which is kind of neat. Um, here's another shot of the building, uh, the hotel. You see the bridge going over the canal, the ladies in their Victorian era dress. Uh, you know, really, obviously a lavish hotel, a neat place. Uh, this is a rare shot inside the hotel. Now, this is taken clearly after the Chautauqua was shut down. That building became the first barracks for the Culver Military Academy. Um, again, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but uh, um, he opens the Culver Military Academy in 1894. Uh, that's really, as you saw, one of the only buildings he's got, and that building lasted uh, a couple of years, and we'll get into what happened to that. But uh, anyway, this is a rare shot inside the hotel. Uh, once it became main barracks, they're obviously eating in there. This is the Tabernacle Building, where the Chautauquas actually took place. And again, we're still talking about Culver Academy grounds here. We're not talking about where we are yet, we'll, where we are now. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, that was also the cadets' first gymnasium. So that little picture in the bottom lower right is the cadets doing calisthenics from Culver Military Academy around 1895 in what was the Chautauqua Tabernacle. So that's kind of an interesting shot. Uh, that building was used for a while for the mess hall. 
Uh, it was used uh, after, after it was the gym, and then eventually it was used for storage, and in 1918 it burned to the ground. But it did last until 1918. Um, this, is a whoa, jumping ahead. this is a familiar face to some of us. Uh, anybody know who that is? Will Osborne, W. Osborne. He was president of the State Exchange Bank through most of the 20th century. He was around to remember this, and he, he talks about, uh, I, I threw this in because it was fun to hear his, his personal memories of it. He was a young child when this Chautauqua operated at the academy, and he's talking about uh, Henry Harrison Culver. He says, he built a tabernacle with sides that swung out to let the air in. I remember walking into the woods near where the dining hall is now. You could, you could have heard them singing for 10 miles. Big crowds attended the meetings and ate public dinners in the woods. And while they were here for the Chautauqua, they got acquainted with the lake. Uh, and I won't go on and on, but, but, but uh, all this time he told his wife he was going to start a school here. He was the last man in the world you'd think he would start a school. He was a manufacturer, and that's the way his mind ran. Uh, he kept going inch at a time. After the Chautauqua, he started a summer school in 1894, and eventually later that, that fall, then he starts called the Military Academy. And again, another nice shot of the Chautauqua Hotel when it became barracks, main barracks. But, Look what happened in, in, uh, in, February, in February of 1895. Most cadets aren't worried at all about that, are they? Uh, in February of 1895, the uh, hotel building burns. Uh, and what's amazing to me is that by September of 1895, seven months later, this building is open for business. Which, you know, even by today's construction standards, is pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, 37 cadets enrolled that year. So. Um, now, Henry Harrison Culver's Chautauqua experiment was short-lived, but in less than 10 years, a uh, similar venture, and let me get my notes pulled together, sorry, I'm sticking together, there we go, a uh, similar venture uh, of greater longevity would emerge. The Max and Cucky Assembly Ground was purchased uh, from M.G. Gould, uh, who received ownership from his father by M.G. Gould, I should say, not from him. M.G. Gould purchased the land. Uh, he received ownership from his father-in-law, Elder Foote, who was a Baptist preacher. And this is an early map. It's early enough that you can't see it over on the right, but uh, that N up near, up near the top right says Niswagi Reservation. So this is a map that still remembers the Indian reservations. Um, so anyway, but there's M.G. Gold owning the land, or Gould. The Lake Max and Cucky Chautauqua Assembly starts in 1899. Uh, it was 26 acres. It took, it, uh, uh, you know, natural, it took advantage of the natural, beautiful oak grove there, uh, as and I'm quoting here, freedom from stagnant pools and marshland, which at the time was effectively used as publicity because such conditions ensured against malaria and mosquito pests. So malaria is still a problem at this point. You know, we have mosquitoes. It's a real concern. A uh, post office was maintained on the grounds. In 1905, long distance phone service, very, very, very chic stuff. A number of cottages, a good hotel for over 100 guests, which is not a small hotel, you know. A large tabernacle, croquet and tennis grounds, and other forms of convenience and pleasure. So, this was in its day really state of the art stuff. You know, it was a very nice place. And basically, uh, it bordered, you know, South Main Street out here was, uh, my understanding, was the west border of the Chautauqua grounds. Uh, it went south to Davis Street, just down there, and uh, uh, did I say south? I'm sorry, north to Davis Street, and south to, as far as I can tell, about to West Shore, you know, where, where it kind of curves off West Shore Drive. So you've got 26 acres there, um, you know, very wooded. What did I just do? Sorry about that. Ah! Let's resume slide check. Can I do that? Sorry. Here we go. Okay. Uh, the fun they had at the Max and Cucky Assembly is the caption on this photo of boys waiting near the assembly grounds taken from the 1905 Max and Cucky Art Annual. I've only seen one of those, and it, it talks about the academy, and it has an extensive section on this assembly. And uh, so again, 1905 Max and Cucky Art Annual. Uh, the assembly also had its own steamer pier, steamboat pier, bathing beach, or swimming beach, and railroad station. So again, I mean, that's, that's a, it's almost like its own self-contained town. I mean, there's a post office, there's a railroad station, there's a hotel, you know, all this stuff. Um, I mean, 
really. There was only the other Culver Railroad Station, you know, down, down the street. So that's, or, well, at the time, Marmont Vandalia. Um, the railroad company advertised transportation right to Max and Kentucky Park. And the excursion rates were inviting. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Under the, this, now the, the, the uh, assembly was under the control of lay members of the Christian church, but it was broad and non-sectarian in its program. Uh, there were privileges <coughs> and, and uh, public exercises. It was known as the Max and Kentucky Assembly of the Christian Church, and this is the tabernacle. Yeah, the tabernacle. I've tried to get sort of a sense of where all this was in the land, and it's, I just don't, as, as of now, I don't have any way of knowing. It's just sheer guesswork, but uh, there's some hilly, hilly land in there, if you think about Peru Court, so I'm not sure where they, where they situated all this. But uh, anyway, according to uh, uh, C.I. Ferrier, the assembly was started similar to the Bethany Chautauqua, Bethany, south of, or southwest of Indianapolis. It was a frame tabernacle open at the sides in the midst of an oak grove. In the area beneath the trees, tents were pitched, and many campers enjoyed the freedom of life in the open during the Chautauqua season. Uh, when the Vandalia trains in July 1905 began to make regular stops at the park gate, every train brought a crowd of visitors. All the cottages were rented. I think that's the tabernacle there on the right. So you can see it is a bit of an oak grove. Uh, there were tents for those who camped, enough of them on the grounds, all occupied to make a miniature white city. So it was quite, you know, quite well attended. Uh, large delegations from Terre Haute tented on the grounds. There were parties of campers from Craffordsville, Franklin, Elwood, Logansport, and other places. Family reunions were a common occurrence on the assembly grounds, and many picnics. Uh, part of the reason you're seeing Terre Haute in those places is that's the way the railroad ran. You know, the Vandalia Line ran north from Terre Haute through Logansport. Um, this is a 1903 program. Known as a refined summer resort, which combined education with elevating entertainment and clean amusement. Uh, a summer school was established with classes and subjects ranging from theology to history, literature, public speaking, and physical culture. The best platform talents were engaged, lecturers, readers, singers, music organizations, with occasional novelties used to, uh, to uh, us usual to such assemblies were daily features. The annual program drew patrons from afar, and the fame of the assembly spread over a wide territory. So it really became well known. Certainly in northern Indiana, it was, it was one of the best known. Um, and it's interesting, they talk about this sort of cultural stuff. Uh, you know, keeping in mind that this was, this was the only entertainment, I can say the only, but it was one of the only forms of entertainment people had in rural areas in America at this time. So uh, they did, you know, they had singers, and they had artists, and they had speakers on all sorts of topics even though the centerpiece of it was, was Christian, you know, theology and that sort of thing. But it was definitely went beyond, beyond that. Um, you can see uh, the season tickets for an adult, a dollar. A dollar for season tickets. Children were 50 cents for this is season tickets. I find that amazing. Uh, a week, a seven-day ticket is 50 cents for an adult. Just amazing, you know. Single admission for the day, 10 cents, you know. Um, it's, you know, they talk about railroad rates and anyway. I kind of throw this in just to give you an idea of what they have. We don't, obviously aren't going to read all this, but you can see the schedule there on the right. It's a packed schedule throughout, uh, through, oh, okay, thank you, throughout the, uh, throughout the day. Um, sorry, let me get my notes organized here. Okay. Come on. And again, just kind of giving you an idea as we go through this program from 1903, uh, you know, there, there's just all kinds of things going on. National Evangel Evangel Evangelistic Congress, Preachers and Sunday School Teachers Congress, um, all sorts of things going on. I thought this was just interesting to throw in. Um, a post office will be had for delivering and receiving all mail. Have your mail. Okay, I won't go into all the detail. Uh, every convenience is provided for ease and comfort. There's groceries, ice, milk, anything you may want delivered at your door. The ground will be policed, so it's perfectly safe. Um, yeah, I'm trying to see what else did I want to throw in there. Um, no charge for camping, but you do have to have a ticket to get in. Uh, all persons transacting business in the park, deliverymen, draymen, attendants at hotel and eating houses must have season tickets, even to do business there. Yeah. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna, I'll just go on. Um, there's an oratorio, oratorio, Passion Week in Jerusalem, which figured prominently in 1905. There were three parts, uh, the crucifixion, 
um, which is actually a crisis represented by stereo optican views. You know what these are? These are basically glass slides projected. Um, you know. Uh, of the great uh, paintings of the world. Second, the sepulcher in which the, you know, if the actual people dressed up as living characters are used. And the third part is the first Easter dawns. You know, they have Mary, the appearance of the Marys and the angels and the illuminated tombs. This is a big, it's quite a production. Um, what happened there? Hmm. Okay. Uh, a description of the oratorio written for the Art Annual of 1905 by Reverend George Streeter, who was the pastor of the Culver Methodist Episcopal Church, which at the time was on Main and Washington Street there, uh, says, Happily for the better rendition of this piece, the character representatives were among the ablest the town afforded. Uh, Miss Ethel Streeter represented the characters of Procla and Mary of, Ma Mary of Magdala. Yeah. The Virgin Mother was played by Mrs. Uh, C.D. Beamer, a Christian mother. Uh, you know, he names other actors and actresses Miss Minnie Schilling. She goes on to marry uh, W. O. Osborne, the, the bank president. All these are, if you, if you know Culver's history, these are all familiar names. You know, Beamer, Minnie Schilling, uh, Murdy Medburn played one of the angels, Jenny Keene and Clara Wiseman, uh, you know, the Wiseman, Dr. Wiseman's house. And actually, I meant to mention that in that last picture. That's Dr. Wiseman, and if you drive you know, north on Main Street from here, you see the old Wiseman house uh, just, just north of the uh, Emanuel Methodist Church. It's got a, a historic marker on it. That was Dr. Wiseman's house, and there he is playing Pontius Pilate. It's Dr. Weiss, yeah, you know. Uh, Chester Ezekiel played Joseph of Arimathea. Um, uh, Mr. Henry Stahl played Caiaphas. And uh, here we see Henry Menser is in this thing. Where would he play? I, just, I threw him in for a reason. Edwin Ezekiel was in it, Levi Osborne, Her uh, Harry Medburn, in the Medburn Ice House. Um, and they really gave credit to uh, Frank C. B Mr. Frank C. Baker. Now, there's a reason. This oh, yeah, Harry Menser was, was one of the Roman soldiers. And I just threw it in because he's one of the few I had a picture of. He looks like a Roman soldier, doesn't he? <laughs> he's got the wrong hat. <laughs> this is Eva Leslie. She was one of the pianists, along with uh, Miss Luke. Lu I'm going to mispronounce this, and none of you know her, because unless you're really old, uh, Miss Larisha Ray. And what's interesting about her, she was the other pianist. She was one of the main pianists. And her father was Dr. Oliver Ray. He was a Civil War veteran who'd been, who had escaped from the Confederates, and he went on to become Culver Academy's first doctor in the 1890s, early 1900s, and he had an office in the top floor of the bank that's still there. If you go, you know, it's the upstairs of the downtown bank. They're the first farmers. And so it's his daughter. It's kind of just an interesting little tie-in. Um, Professor Eli Mil Miller was the president of the assembly. He managed the choruses and took a part in the rendition of the oratorio. Um, and they give a lot of credit to Captain H.F. Noble, who gave the panoramic representation, not sure what that is, and managed the calcium light for the stage, the calcium light. So we don't have electric light, we've got calcium light. Uh, what's kind of fun, too, is that here we have this guy. This is Frank Houston. Uh, he writes a song, a popular song called Max and Cucky. And the idea was he's going to write the song, publish the sheet music, and get people to sing it, and it's about the assembly. And so he hopes that everybody's going to you know, make a hit out of the song, and everybody's going to want to come to the Max and Cucky assembly. Uh, he writes this around 1905. Uh, he was actually a businessman, a preacher, a composer, a singer, a poet, very popular soloist. Uh, he had a national reputation in the Church of Christ as, as a singer and evangelist. And he writes this poem. Uh, I'm just going to read part of it. The poets sing, or I shouldn't say poem, song. This is the song he tried to make a big hit. Uh, the poets sing of the Emerald Isle with waters entrancingly fair, and Switzerland boasts of her gem and the Alps resplendent with beauty so rare. Though over and over the world I go, there's beauty on every hand I know, and countless joys to be found, but oh, tis fair Max and Cucky for me. Uh, and here's the refrain. Oh, let us go boasting, go merrily, I'm sorry, boating, not boasting, boating, go merrily floating, over the crystal wave will glide, and from care be free. Oh, here's a treasure, here's joy without measure. I'm so lucky, and Fair Max and Cucky is the place for me. <laughs> so if I knew the music, we could all sing along. <laughs> We'd still make a hit out of it. <laughs> here's Queen Esther. Um, I'm trying to see who, who plays Queen Esther. Let's see, I've got it in here. It's way too much information here. Uh, that was really the big hit of the year in 1905. They, they pulled out all the stops for Queen Esther, and it got rave reviews. I mean, people, you know, people made a big deal out of it. 
Um, it was a beautiful and wonderful oratorio, uh, said the advance announcement in the 1904 catalog or program. Uh, you know, uh, da, 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 way too much information. Da, da, da. Lecture on Queen Esther and King Ahasur, you know the one, was given <laughs> at the Methodist Church on a, Sunday, on a Sunday evening preceding the assembly performance. So I thought that was interesting. Downtown at the Methodist Church, they're, they're sort of plugging this thing ahead of time with sermons and everything. Um, anyways, big deal. Who played Queen Esther? Miss uh, Ethel Streeter played Queen Esther. That's her in the picture. Um, Chester Ezekiel played Mordecai the Jew, etc., etc., etc. I won't give all the parts, but, uh, but that was the big hit of the season. Oh, and I had to throw this guy in. Um, <clears throat> this is Reno Wellborn. He was the wizard of electricity. And so he, he was one of the, and as again, this throws in that angle. He does, he's not preaching, he's nothing like that. He's just one of the novelties that people came to see. This was big stuff. You know, you came for miles around to see the wizard of electricity here. I found an ad for him from somewhere else. That's not really from Culver, but his, his program was in the year 2000. So he's imagining what life's going to be like in the year 2000. Um, it's 1905. It's the sixth annual session. H.G. Hill was general manager. Um, on Patriotic, Patriotic Day, Honorable James Watson was the orator. Uh, he was an eloquent member of Congress. He was, an, he was a congressman. Uh, there were others, readers, singers, musicians, lecturers, entertainers, and artists. Uh, Mr. Hill, the, the manager, declaring the assembly grounds the best natural location he's ever seen, said, God had already done a great deal for this place. If we do ours, it will be equal to any assembly in the United States. So hopes are high for the Max and Cookie Assembly. Uh, on the day designated as Watson Day, Congressman Watson delivered the patriotic address. There were aquatic sports that day, naval demonstration, and a sham battle by the cadets of the Culver Naval School. That's what we see there at the lower right. Um, oh gosh, in the evening, Dr. D.B. Lucas, Department Commander of the Indiana Grand Army of the Republic, spoke. There was a water carnival, a lantern parade by boat, fireworks. Big deal. And I find that interesting. That's 1905. Uh, that's the last season. So they, they had to, they're building up to this great season, and that's the, that's the end. Uh, no, don't stop running this script. What are you doing? <laughs> what? Did I, like, kill it? There's my email. Hi, email. Okay. Um, and I do want to throw in before we before we talk about the demise. Just going. This this was a great find. Um, I just have to just tell this little story. I got a call. I keep doing that. I'm, I'm a monster with this thing. Um, I, I got a call that someone was was in Culver from Mishawaka. He was an elderly gentleman. His grandfather had had a hotel uh, on on the on the near the park, uh, and he brought us this pile of stuff from about 1901, including this. This is where I got the only picture I've ever seen of the Chautauqua Hotel and the tabernacle. This is the 1901 program, and you can again kind of get an idea uh, of what, what, what these were like. Um, oop. You know, they're talking about the talent, you know, some of the people they were bringing in for the season. I won't go through all of them, but there were certainly some renowned people. Keeps jumping ahead. Ah, stop it. Okay, sorry. And again, here's where we get the only picture I've ever seen of the tabernacle. Um, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, oh, there's a prohibition encampment in, in July, by the way. And that was a big movement in Culver. The prohibition movement was huge. Um, a temperance, temperance movement. Very big in Culver. Uh, in that period. You know, temperance. <laughs> no alcohol. Okay. All right. Um, come on. Again, there's the program. Not that we're going to go through it, but just to give you an idea of how full it is. Well, uh, uh, I, uh, it's kind of crazy. I found this actually on the internet. This is uh, just a, a railway uh, announcement from, from 1904. And you can see the Max and Kentucky Assembly was one of the important national public meetings and conventions listed here, you know, among others, which is kind of neat. I mean, they've got some in Boston, they've got them in Louisville, they've got them in Illinois and Toronto, and there's Culver. That, that gives you an idea of the stature of the Mexico Assembly in its day. It's interesting, there's Kankakee over there. Kankakee, yeah, Richmond, Virginia, you and, know. And Talmadge had a huge ranch, a huge piece of property just outside of Kankakee to the east. Reverend Talmadge did. I, I don't know if Reverend Talmadge did, but there's, there's something called the Talmadge Ranch. Hmm. 
it may have been a huge piece of property. Hmm. It's well, he was certainly a, a big figure in that day. It could have been him. Um, here's the night. Well, we already saw that. Why is that there? Um, nothing, you know, good things don't last forever. Um, right during what seemed to be the biggest years, the end was already approaching. And I'm quoting here from Edwin Corwin's 1930s book, One Township's Yesteryears, which is you can read on the, uh, on the library website online, which is a, it's a really neat book. He goes through and, and details a lot of this. Uh, he says, stealthily creeping in upon the assembly when the activity was at its height is the end. The turn of the century had been reached and passed. The gas buggy was stirring up the dust of country highways, and at the same time writing in the dust the symbols that spelled the doom of many customs and institutions of the 19th century. And so it is that we read in the news of the 7th of December, 1905, the following sentence, quote, James V. Combs has filed a suit for foreclosure of a mortgage on the Max and Cuckie Assembly grounds, unquote. Um, I've never been able to find out exactly what happened. You would think that uh, with all the glory they seem to be enjoying at that time, that's, I mean, I, I can see it declining, but it just abruptly ended in 1905. They're foreclosing. Who knows? You know, I don't know. Maybe it'll come to light someday. But, <clears throat> but it's not in any of the official literature, which is not a surprise, but <clears throat> or the newspapers. Um, some of the land was later uh, platted by J.O. Ferrier. We'll talk about him in a second. Streets were cut through given Cuban or Spanish names. So some of you may have driven up on Batabano Street or, uh, or Obispo Street, you know, looking at the map, Tampa Street, Prado Street, Nueva Gorda. I used to wonder, what are these Spanish names doing in Culver, Indiana? Uh, and it really all had to do with uh, the Ferriers, Rosa and, and Oliver, uh, who had gone to Florida. They wanted a trip to Florida. Everybody does that now, but in those days that was a big deal. They went to Florida, you know, and they, and they got Spanish Cuban names from going down there. So when they platted this, this area, this, this Max and Cucky Assembly grounds into a town edition of 89 lots, uh, it was called the Ferrier Edition. Anybody who owns any property, probably if you had the abstract for this church, you go back far enough, it's going to say the Ferrier Edition. You know, that's the, it's probably still the official legal name is this is, this is the Ferrier Edition. Um, <clears throat> And just to give you an idea, this is, this is J.O. Ferrier. Uh, he's, if you go down across the street from the Culver Cove, he had the, some of you will remember this building on the north side of, the, of Jefferson Street. He had Ferrier Lumber Company. Um, there's Clark Ferrier actually there. Um, and he's the, I think he's the father. He's the elder Ferrier. But I, I could be wrong about that. Anyway, but that's the Ferriers. They were, uh, they were, a, it was a project here in, in Culver for many years. Uh, the Culver Citizen in January 1909 says, J.O. Ferrier's purchase of the old assembly grounds on the West Shore less than two years ago has proved the wisdom of the buyer. He has sold enough lots to pay for the land and has 60 lots left, which he says he can sell outright any day for $6,000. The assembly hotel, oh, I made it burn too quickly. Well, you see what happened to it. Um, the assembly hotel actually survived, I mean, it stayed <clears throat> around after the 1905 close of the, the assembly, uh, it was renamed the Ralston Hotel. The Ralston, A-R-A-L-S-T-O-N, Hotel. There's still a building that says Ralston on it, but it, it, it isn't the same building. This, this one, there was a, a, a fire in 1910 that was put out by the Bucket Brigade, but in 1911 there's a kitchen fire, and that, that just burns the whole building to the ground. And Yeah, it's interesting to see this, because that's the other side. We saw the earlier photo from the, the, the land side, facing out towards the lake. This is obviously shot from the lake side. Uh, it's an old postcard, colorized postcard. And you can see, if you look closely, it says Ralston right there. So this is after 1905, but before 1911, and it's, it's burning. Well, it didn't really burn the postcard, <laughs> as you know. Um, <clears throat> Come on. Traveling Chautauquas continued to be a not, in, not infrequent part of Culver's social life. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I didn't really get time or I wasn't able to pull together. But over the years, just pouring through old Culver citizens, I have found uh, articles about, you know, oh, the Chautauquas coming. You know, and I'm not talking about this one. This would be in the 1930s, the 1920s. Um, during various periods, a tent Chautauqua would arrive each summer for a few days or a week. It was the hit affair of the moment. I mean, it was really the, the place to be during that week or two here in Culver. Um, you know, notice of the events turns up in the pages of the Culver Citizen in the 20s and 30s. Some people even still remember that. I mean, I've talked to one lady, I believe it was Marge Overmeyer, who's still with us, 
and summers here in Culver remembered going as a little girl to the Chautauqua. And it wasn't this one, it was, uh, it was in the town park. And that's usually where they had them um, when they came to Culver. Uh, so it's hard to say when the very last Chautauqua pulled up stakes in Culver as far as the tent ones. Uh, there is still a regular Chautauqua, a permanent Chautauqua operating in southern Indiana today uh, that you can go to. <clears throat> it's one of the few left in, in the United States. Uh, many of them that are still operating in the United States have much less, if, if at all, of a religious nature. They're more of a cultural program. Uh, but there are still programs calling themselves Chautauquas. And maybe we'll even see one here again in Culver one day, even if it's just a, you know, even if it's just a, re a revived kind of for fun. But, uh, but that's pretty much what I have. Now, you know, unless any of you have questions, um, before I turn it over to Pastor Dan, if there isn't any questions? What exactly does talk about mean? Right. Um, the nearest, I, I think it was simply named after the lake, which is kind of funny. Um, I mean, you think about it, because it's taken on so much meaning, Chautauqua. I mean, we, you know, we, now we think of it as this religious program and all that, but it really, I think it just was named because the first one was on that lake. And I think that lake, like our lake, was given the name or retained the name that the, the Indians, Native American Indians, had given it. So I think that, in my understanding, I, I, I confess I haven't really researched this at all, but um, I, I believe Chautauqua was an Indian name. And it just was called, that was what the Indians called that lake. And so here we are. Yeah. That, and good, I still, that didn't answer your actual question. I don't know what it means. <laughs> just the lake. We're going to a Chautauqua at Chautauqua, New York, in a couple of weeks. I heard that. So you told me that. On uh, foreign, uh, foreign affairs. Okay. And have you been to that one before? Yeah, it was. Okay. And, but, but it was, I'm, I'm understanding it really probably wasn't so much a religious theme. Program, yeah. So. They have a, a, a lake, a big lake, Chautauqua Lake, and they have a old, big old hotel. Mm. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's the first one. That's the one that started it all. You know, at Chautauqua, there, I assume, anyway, it's the same one. But yeah, it's still there. A lot like Chautauqua. I mean, that, that Chautauqua is still there, it's still going, obviously. Any questions or comments? <clears throat> Well, and, and you know, uh, I guess I've kept kept you a little longer than I expected. But um, if you if you can give a few minutes, I think I'm interested to hear what Pastor Dan says. Just how, how you know, because we I think we all know about Lake Winona and Billy Sunday, and how you know how did that how was that different? How was it the same? You know, it's, it, it was very similar at the beginnings, I think, in some ways, but it's still going. So that you know, I think that'll be that'll be kind of an interesting thing to hear. And I'll go down and plug. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Ooh. I don't want to keep you over an hour. Uh, an hour seems to be the magical time. Uh, and uh, so we'll, we'll uh, get through this and uh, uh, get you on your way here. Uh, I'm certainly uh, there's certainly a lot more to this than uh, than uh, what uh, we're able to look at tonight. Uh, but uh, this is the history of of the Chautauqua over in Winona Lake. Uh, it didn't start out as that at all. The area surrounding Eagle Lake, which is its original name, uh, was originally the home of the Potawatomi Indians. The, uh, a treaty was signed with the tribe in 1934, and I guess that meant that they move out, and uh, it's open for settlement for the white man. And so the first white settlers uh, moved in shortly after that, shortly after 1834. By 1881, the Byer Brothers, B-E-Y-E-R, Byer Brothers, were attracted there by the many natural springs around there. I didn't know there was a lot of springs around there. A lot of them were shut up, uh, were, were closed up uh, since then. And uh, we'll, we'll see that. Um, thanks, Jeff. Is that okay? Here you want. 
you want that on? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, that's, okay. that's great. Okay. <laughs> it's uh, okay. the filters booting up and all that. Uh, and uh, so they, they were attracted by the natural springs around the lake. They were dairy type of people. They, they had dairy farms. They produced dairy goods. And back then, before you had refrigeration and uh, you didn't have ice in the summertime, uh, of course, natural springs was the uh, good way for refrigeration. And that's what attracted them there. And uh, so they, they bought that land for that. And it served for cooling systems for their dairy, syst uh, dairy business. In uh, six years after that, uh, the buyers uh, uh, plotted their, their farmland into a resort known as Spring Fountain Park. And that's where Winona Lake is right now. Um, so they, they wanted to start a, uh, uh, an amusement park. Uh, from what I understand, there were buyers that were coming from Chicago, from, from Ohio, from Indianapolis, and these buyers would, would stay there overnight, and so they wanted to provide some kind of amusement for these, these buyers. And so they, 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 they bought this park with the idea of setting up an amusement park. I don't have pictures, that's why I'm not panicking yet. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so they set this up. Things, the first thing that they built was the Winona Hotel. Um, it's still standing today. Um, it, it fell into disrepair and uh, they were debating about tearing it down. It was condemned along with the Billy Sunday Tabernacle, which we'll see. But uh, they determined to restore it and it's used right now as dormitories for Grace College. And in the summertime, there's still some um, Bible conference that's going on over there. Uh, they use it for hotel rooms, but that is ancient. And uh, that's, uh, that, was, that was one of the, the very first pictures. That's funny now because running right in front of that is, is a road and parking lot, and there's buildings all around. There's a bank right behind there. And uh, so... Uh, you build a big building like that, and you think, What's, what, what else is there around there? But uh, that was back in uh, uh, around 1887. In uh, 1894, Dr. Solomon Dickey, who was a uh, leader in the Presbyterian Church, dreamed of starting a Chautauqua. And he wanted to, and, and so he was looking for a good area to start it. Eagle Leak. <laughs> Eagle Lake is where he, he purchased the Spring Fountain Park, which is where Winona Lake is now. He used his denomination's resources. The Presbyterian Church bought uh, that land. And so a corporation known as the Winona Assembly and Summer School Association was formed. The first conference was held the following summer, 1895. Isn't that something? That's right between the two Chautauquas here. 1895, that was starting. Five years after the Culver uh, uh, thing uh, folded up. And uh, so for the first 10 years, from 1895 to 1905, uh, they had a board of directors. Famous people sat on it. H.J. Heights, the, uh, the, the tomato uh, mogul. Uh, John Studebaker and William Jennings Bryan, uh, these sat on the board of the Winona Assembly. Many structures were erected and improvements were made on the property. A uh, canal was dug. Uh, we'll see a little bit later on, there's a peninsula that juts out into Winona Lake and they dug uh, a canal 
which turned that peninsula into a island, an island. And that was back in 1902. And that, uh, they call it McDonald Island. It was after the one who financed the, the digging of the canal. Uh, many cottages and homes were built at that time. Um, the Beyer Home, the Swiss Terrace. Uh, some of you perhaps have uh, heard of the uh, Swiss Terrace. Uh, some of the uh, um, some of the history behind that. The Pennsylvania Railroad skirted the, the north edge of Winona Lake and uh, had a, a train stop, a train station there in Warsaw, and that brought a lot of visitors from uh, east and west. Uh, there was rapid growth in the assembly, so that in those 10 years it grew from uh, 35, the first year, up to 10,000 um, regular, and, and it kept growing after that. Some other things were uh, started, uh, for example, the gymnasium. Uh, the gymnasium, uh, when, uh, when we knew uh, the place back in the 70s, that's, that's when uh, my wife and I moved out there to go to Grace College and Seminary, uh, this was the photography um, uh, barn. It, it looks like a barn. And a uh, photography barn. I mean, it, it's amazing. It's, it's almost in a slum section right now. The streets are very narrow. The houses are just packed in around here. There's a lot of student housing there. And if you know student housing for colleges, uh, they're kind of slummy. <laughs> I mean, they're cheap. And uh, that's the best way they can live. And they're packed in around there. And you look at it there when it was first built. Uh, there's nothing there. Uh, goodness. So, uh, gymnasium. Uh, there were educational movements that, that, that uh, came along with that. It was the Chautauqua now. It was beyond the... Um, the, uh, the amusement park. The amusement park at one time, even it, it, it had a, a oh, various rides there, and it even had a racetrack. I don't know what kind of racetrack it was. Back at the turn of the century, I'm sure it wasn't, uh, uh, you know, with race cars, <laughs> uh, either dogs or horses, but I know that the Christians there outlawed it after two years. <laughs> So there must have been some stuff going on there, uh, along with the racing. Uh, but moving beyond that, when the Presbyterian bought it, uh, then the whole thing changed. It, it became a Chautauqua. It was no longer just an amusement park. It was now Chautauqua. And uh, so that was a, a gymnasium uh, that they built. Uh, there were uh, educational endeavors. Uh, for example, uh, there was an agricultural institute. There was a technical institute. And there was something called Winona College. It was a four-year liberal arts school. It's not the present uh, Grace College that's there. Uh, Grace College, first the seminary came uh, somewhere around 37. And then the college started up around 1950-ish, something like that. And uh, so this is not connected at all. Uh, the, uh, the seminary and, great, and, and, uh, and college are Grace Brethren denomination. Uh, this this was uh, completely different. Um, it, it was it was a secular school, liberal arts school. It was financed mostly uh, where by the Winona Railroad, the Pennsylvania Railroad. I didn't get the details, but the Pennsylvania Railroad didn't produce, or they they couldn't bring in uh, the uh, passengers. Uh, starting around 1905 for some reason. Maybe it turned into a freight train or something. I don't know what. Uh, I don't know what happened there, but they couldn't do it, so Winona built their own railroad. But instead of going east and west, this thing went north and south. It went from Peru clear up to Goshen, and it would pick up people uh, along uh, various stops up there and bring them down into Winona. Uh, and so uh, they had... Uh, they had quite a system going on there. Um, the, uh, the second 10 years, from 1905 to 1914, the park became well established. The schools were growing. Um, the Chautauqua programs were held in the old auditorium. Uh, that, that thing's been long torn down. It's, uh, there's something there now called the Road Heaver Auditorium. 
uh, a nice new auditorium, but that was an older one. Uh, that was before the Billy Sunday Tabernacle, and uh, all the uh, programs were held in there. The, uh, they brought in distinguishing speakers and musicians. They had a uh, steamboat. It was called, very original, City of Warsaw. <laughs> a steamboat. Uh, and it took regular cruises. It held 150 people. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, it, it, it was growing. The period of 1905 to 1914 was called the golden age of Winona's history because the summer attendance reached quarter of a million during the summers. Mm. Uh, they were just bringing in the people. And I'm sure when this Chautauqua folded uh, from 1905 to 1915, uh, uh, um, that's, uh, I'm sure these people went over there. Uh, I imagine, and helped increase that. But quarter of a million it reached, and it, it never saw that since then. Uh, that was the, the highest. In fact, they had, this is, uh, if, if any of you go into Winona Lake, uh, you know that uh, when you come off Old Route 30, um, you go down under a viaduct, and uh, there's, a, there's a five point section right there. That's what you're looking at right here, you see the turnstiles that are there. They put a fence around the whole Winona town. A fence. You couldn't get in. This is the only way you paid $6 to go for, I think it was two weeks of, of conferences. If, if you were a student or a pastor, you got a half price or a missionary. <laughs> but there's fence there, and there's a turnstile, and you can see the cars waiting to go in. Uh, and 250,000 people going in. I mean, they, they, they knew how to manage this thing. They had a board uh, set, set up, and, and they, were, they were doing it. Uh, now, this is uh, lined up right down there along uh, the lake. To the left is Winona Lake. Uh, to the right would be Billy Sunday Tabernacle, which is not built there yet. And uh, look at all the... Look at all the old cars. Uh, this is Winona Lake Drive, and uh, so they were they were coming for the uh, for, for the sessions. That turnstile that I mentioned is up here, maybe about a quarter of a mile. And when you come down here, uh, right here would be the island. Right here, the canal would be dug. Oh, probably right about here. So uh, that's, that's where we are there. Uh, this would be the post office, if you know the area right now. The post office would be right about here. Uh, my wife and I spent some good times down here, eating lunch uh, down there, and didn't look anything like that uh, back in the 70s. Uh, remember the many ponds, uh, many streams? Uh, springs, springs. Look at this spring. I mean, they have it coming right through a tree, <laughs> and uh, the, the the iron the, the water there is very iron rich, and so they said this was very medicinal, and so all of these springs around uh, would be uh, flowing, and they'd have tin cups uh, hanging on. I think you can see is something hanging here on the tr on the on the tree. And you just grab the tin cup and, uh, you know, take a drink and hang it back up. Next guy would come along and grab the tin cup. <laughs> and uh, that, that was a treat there. Uh, later on, when uh, they started having problems with, with diseases, they plugged up many of the springs. So we don't even know where the springs are today. Uh, that's why I say I, I, I don't know of any springs down there. Everything goes underground and feeds into the lake. Um, this is the lily pond that's on the east shore of Winona Lake. This is right about across the road from, um, from the post office, and it's still there today. I'll have another picture of it uh, at, at the end of the session. Um, Billy Sunday at that time uh, made his home in uh, Winona Lake right around the turn of the century. Billy Sunday was a, a baseball player. Here's a baseball card. Uh, with Billy Sunday on it. Um, he was a young baseball player turned evangelist. 
the Lord saved him, and uh, he, he was won to the Lord by a uh, worker from... Uh, huh, trying to think of the mission in Chicago. Moody? Moody by Moody. Uh, no, not, not the institute, but the, there's a... There's a Hope Rescue Mission downtown. Uh, anyway. Anyway. Was that Moody? Was that Moody? Uh, well, that's, that's the Institute. No. But there's a... Whole house? It's still there today. And you can listen to programs put on Unshackled on, on the radio. Pacific Garden Mission. Pacific Garden Mission. Now, a lady from Pacific Garden Mission led him to the Lord. And uh, he was a... He was, he was uh, an aspiring uh, young baseball player at the time. He played for the Chicago White Stockings, <laughs> which uh, became the, the Cubs, uh, turned into the Cubs. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, he, uh, he turned evangelist. They offered him astronomical uh, salary, uh, $2,000, uh, uh, I think it was a month, to play for them. And uh, he turned it down. He worked instead as an evangelist for something like uh, um, $180 a month uh, because he felt called to the Lord uh, to do that. So here's, here's Billy Sunday. Uh, he was assisted by his song leader, Homer Roadheaver. You've seen a lot of uh, music that he penned. Um, Billy Sunday was a dynamic uh, preacher. Oops. Uh, he was he was known for his, his gymnastics on the stage when he would preach, and uh, very dynamic. Um, and his ministry reached all across uh, a, uh, all across the uh, the land. Um, here's the uh, the tabernacle. You can see this is the one in Winona Lake. Now Billy Sunday would go to various cities and he would preach. And if he made a regular stop there, they would actually build a tabernacle there. So there's many Billy Sunday tabernacles, and they're not made all out of wood. There, there are a number of them that are uh, uh, block structures and brick structures. But uh, here's the Billy Sunday tabernacle. It's not there anymore. It was condemned. And uh, the Grace College and Seminary would have their graduation services there every spring. And uh, um, in, a, in his tabernacles, you would have... Straw, uh, sawdust trails. When a person uh, would come forward to give their heart to the Lord, they would walk the old sawdust trails. And uh, when you graduated, you walked the sawdust trails. Uh, first new pair of shoes I ever bought was for my graduation. And uh, I got a little dirty walking the sawdust trail uh, when I graduated. Uh, but ours was the last class to graduate. They tore it down in 1986. Uh, that's when I graduated there from seminary. And so, but here's the tabernacle. It looks a lot bigger from this thing. I mean, actually, it, it wasn't all that big, but, but from inside, it's, phew, that really looks big. Uh, here's a uh, map of, uh, of, of, of Winona Lake. Uh, here's, here's the canal that was dug across there. Uh, and uh, the island... Uh, the uh, Billy Sunday Tabernacle was built here. It's it's not in place yet. They they talk about the assembly, and that's that's the center of the epicenter right here, <laughs> the the uh, the assembly place, and that's not there anymore. The Tabernacle was over here. The big hotel I mentioned is right here. That's it, and this is where you would come down uh, under the uh, uh, overpass into Winona Lake right here. Here's the railroad that still goes there, the Pennsylvania Railroad. And that's what goes over top of the overpass. Um, so that was the Billy Sunday era. And uh, I'm get, gonna get you out here in a minute or two. Uh, there was a setback in 1950, 15, 1915, financial setback. They came to financial ruin. Uh, it was due in part to the losses in railroad venue. Uh, and the assembly was forced to declare bankruptcy. There was a reorganization and a reform under the Winona Assembly and Bible Conference. Chautauqua was beginning to die. I understand with the coming of the automobile and the radio, people weren't uh, 
uh, all that interested in the secular part of, of the Chautauqua. Uh, they wanted more of the Bible teaching. And so in 1920, uh, they founded the Winona Lake School of Theology under G. Campbell Morgan. Uh, that, that school of theology is still over there. It's a summer institute uh, that you can attend. And in uh, 1921, okay, that's not it. Oh, the uh, tabernacle was constructed, uh, the Billy Sunday Tabernacle. He had been preaching there a number of years, and that's when they built that. It seats 7,500, by the way. Still, that picture looks bigger than that. <laughs> uh, in the 20s and 30s, it was a time of decline, like it was all across America. Uh, the Chautauqua programs generally were discontinued. In uh, 1938, there was reorganization. It was called the Winona Lake Christian Assembly. And uh, religious conventions were the major emphasis. Uh, they were aided in their efforts. Uh, by a number of religious organizations that made their home in Winona Lake. The Free Methodist Church had their headquarters there. The Grace Brethren Church put their headquarters there. Oriental Mission Society was there, and Grace College and Seminary were founded there. And uh, so these were the world headquarters for all these religious organizations, and it helped keeping the, 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 the Bible um, uh, a part of it going now. And, uh, and so it became known now as the world's largest Bible conference. In the 50s and 60s, um, it witnessed a revival of the Winona uh, Lake Bible Conference, as, as it's known as now. Groups as My Booty Bible Institute would come there. I remember sitting there in the Billy Sunday Tabernacle and seeing a booth that was suspended from the ceiling, and it was MBI. Uh, they had their, their programmers there who were recording the programs that they would broadcast over their uh, radio stations then. Uh, Youth for Christ was there, had their convention there every summer. Um, the General Association of Regular Baptists would have their conventions there, and this helped boost it up. Uh, R.G. Letourneau was now um, directing the, the financial end of it. Some of you know Letourneau, who, um, who invented some of the great earth-moving machines that are around today. Uh, he, uh, he started a, uh, uh, he has his Letourneau um, um, University down in Texas, uh, Technological University. He was the first one to invent uh, putting a, an engine inside of, of a wheel. Um, and in other words, these big earth-moving machines, he put an engine inside of each wheel, and he perfected that. Before that, though, he was, uh, he was a Christian since he was a child, but he wasn't tithing. And he was a million dollars in debt, and this was back in, I don't know, the uh, 20s or 30s. And uh, finally, he told the Lord, Lord, if, if, if you get me out of this, he says, whether you get me out of this or not, I'm going to start tithing. But... I'm going to give 90% to you. I'm going to keep 10% myself. And the Lord helped him put these engines together. He made, became a billionaire. And now today, uh, he's, he's gone, but his, his interest lives on. He still, he lived by that all his life. And he has helped countless missionaries, churches, Bible institutes all across the world. Uh, he's still a, a rich millionaire, keeping one-tenth and giving nine-tenths to God. But he made that promise, and God turned everything around for him. That's Letourneau, and he's sitting on the board here. Um, and so uh, under him, uh, uh, they, they pulled in 60000 a year. Um, this is uh, the lily pond uh, today. Um, it's... Uh, it, the, uh, everything is still in, in good shape over there, although it wasn't. Because in 1968, um, Grace Schools had to take over the, the Chautauqua, the, the, the Bible Conference. It had fallen apart, um, and it assumed its, its debt. Um, by the late 1980s, a uh, continued lack of investment and declining numbers of attendees uh, led to the, uh, the termination of, of everything. It, it stopped in the 80s. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, saw a severe decline in all the real estate. It, it became a slum and a mess, um, uh, it, especially the island. 
it was housing for the students, but it, it wasn't good at all. And so in 1994, the Winona Restoration Company took over. It was headed by local entrepreneurs Dane Miller and Brent Wilcoxon. And they, they bought out much of the property on the island. They moved it out, and they moved in beautiful homes in the place. And they have nice little um, 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 uh, businesses there now. And uh, so, well, that's where we're at right now. Uh, there's a, uh, there are still some Bible conferences going on there. Our church went over just this past uh, uh, summer, uh, Friends of Israel uh, has their conference over there once a year, and uh, there are a few other um, Bible uh, groups that have their conferences there. So it's still going on as a Bible conference. I don't know if you could call it the world's biggest anymore or whatever, but it's 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 hanging in there ha! anymore. That's it. Um, a really quick Culver story about Billy Sunday. I don't know if this is true, and I'll, then I'll shut up. But uh, in a 1960 Culver alumnus magazine, Colonel Rosso's widow, if you know Colonel Rosso was director of the Black Horse Troop for years, uh, in an interview said, well, back, back in the teens, Colonel Rosso and I put together these, these plays every year, and the cadets loved it. And one year, he assigned this cadet to be the horse thief in the play. And General Ginolette pulled him aside and said, you know, could you find somebody else? Because that's Billy Sunday's son. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. I've never been able to substantiate Billy Sunday's son being there. But anyway. <laughs> I, uh, I tried to find out information on his sons, and uh, I, I couldn't. Uh, I may yet find it in the academy if it's real, you know, as I dig deeper. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> any, any questions? If not, let's head downstairs for, for stuff.